Ah, apologies. Didn't realise we'd already started recording. I was uh, caught up in a good book. And a good book for the kitchen. Kitchen Cowboys, which is important for two reasons. For me, it's important because Kitchen Cowboys, the book and the class, was what set me on my cooking journey. And it's also important because today's chef on Kitchen Clothes is the man who wrote it, the original South African Kitchen Cowboy, Pete Goffwood. He's a great cooking celebrity in South Africa, a great TV figure, and an absolutely fabulous chef. So let's head over to somewhere in the deepest, darkest corners of Hub Bay and say hello, Pete Goffwood. Hey, Dan, how's it going, man? Really good and, and full of really good memories because I've just been flicking through this. In fact, I've been using this. I dug it up at the start of lockdown. This was the first cookbook I ever got and I got it from you and I remember reviewing it and being slightly scared of this uh, chef who looked like a bouncer at a Russian nightclub. And then you very kindly <laughs> invited me along uh, to your Kitchen Cowboys course. And I spent six weeks having so much fun and, and learning the basics of cooking. And in all of the stuff that you've done and you've cooked all over the world, I reckon Kitchen Cowboys must be pretty high up the list of fun that you've had in a kitchen. It, it was. It was very, very satisfying. I think most chefs will tell you that one of the things that they it, it, they like doing is giving back and, 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 and training and, and teaching people. And I was very, very fortunate with the Kitchen Cowboys format that it really was good fun. You know, that six weeks we used eight, ten guys at a time. Um, and I really thoroughly enjoyed watching guys develop in the kitchen, you know, honing their skills and, and more than anything, developing confidence. Um, and that for me, which is a big a big thing about cooking, is confidence. You know, the, the ability to try something new, to, 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 to trust yourself, to open up books on, on what look like seemingly impossible recipes and having a go at it, you know. And I'm able to do that to a degree because I've got, all the confidence that you invested in me, which I'm very grateful for. But I also love about Kitchen Cowboys is that it's a book that's really accessible if you're pretty early on in your food journey. And I know that's been a hallmark of your cooking when you are imparting knowledge. Yes, you can create absolutely magical 17 course feasts, but you're also able to, as we see in this book, and as we're doing today, give somebody a lesson that's really not that hard to reproduce. That's always been the thing for me with teaching, you know. I think with with, with, in recipe books, in, in, in lectures, and in demonstrations as well, it needs to be food that's accessible. You know, otherwise it just becomes this chef mutual masturbation society where look at me, look how cool I am. I've got the coolest ingredients, and I'm going to make a spuma, and I'm going to uh, put something in a sous vide machine at four degrees for 17 days, and then I'm going to travel into the desert at full moon and pick a blossom from a tree that only blossoms every leap year. And you think, great, that's fantastic, the food looks brilliant, but I could never watch, I could never try that. I want to, I'd rather have someone watch it and go, you know, I've never known how to make a risotto. It always looks so difficult. I've just seen Pete do a video. We can definitely do that. <laughs> no. Sorry, the don't have a video. Dan. I'll see the, uh, the Goff fan, uh, the Goffwood fan club is uh, out in force and cheering you on. And I suspect yes. the reason your dog is barking is because he can smell what is being prepared. And what is being prepared is something most people think they can do, but actually a lot of people don't get quite right. So today, Pete, you're going to teach me how to make the perfect steak bernays. That we're going to do, indeed. I think it's it's one of those simple, delicious dishes and done properly, it's a, it's a thing to behold. And yes, I think Ben and Sam think there might be a slither in there for them, but uh, not a chance. So I've got the ingredients, which you sent you to me yesterday. I've got my steak that's being marinated in Worcester sauce and olive oil. I've got the Bernays sauce ingredients. How do I kick off? So what I've just started on, I've got on, on, my, on my stove here, I've got a little bit of wine that's reducing, white wine, some finely diced onions, and some uh, tarragon vinegar. Now, if you don't have tarragon vinegar, I've made some by just um, using some white wine vinegar and some dried tarragon and let that sit for an hour just to get that lovely that lovely sort of aniseed from the bitterness from the tarragon. We're just going to let that cook down for a couple of seconds. And then I've got some melted butter here. One thing I, I neglected to mention to you is I've just got some uh, chives, some chopped chives here. Okay, so Pete, so I've got my pot. Uh, what sort of heat am I putting it on here? You want it quite high because we want it to reduce down quite quickly. We're you want to reduce the liquid down by half, so the quicker the better. Right, so it's the white wine. I've uh, I've gone for some Ardensach Chardonnay from Robertson, uh, wow. which I'd much rather be drinking in the current climate, but I shall use it for the dish instead. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Right, the white wine is in, and then in goes uh, the white. Uh, I've got some white wine vinegar. Will that suffice? Yes, that'll do. Okay. And then uh, I've got some dry tarragon. Will that be okay? Perfect. Perfect. You'd be amazed right. how much, how much per the beautiful flavour that uh, the dry tarragon actually does impart. So I've got white wine, I've got white wine vinegar in the absence of tarragon vinegar, and I've got some dry tarragon. Just stir Good. it around a bit and let it reduce. That's it, let that get it on, let they bring up the boil and reduce down by half. There we go. So now of course, I've only got, because we're doing this outside, I only got one burner, so I've, I've reduced mine down, and I'm just getting my double boiler up to speed so that we can get cracking with the, with the burners. We've got our three egg yolks in a bowl. My stainless steel bowl is going to go on top of the double boiler when that gets nice and hot. As, a, as my wife is not here at the moment, I've gone with one of her very finest white china bowls that we got as a wedding gift nine years ago. <laughs> oh, yes. And uh, it might mysteriously disappear afterwards, and I'll blame the dog. Yeah, so you get your egg yolks and put and pour some of your, your reduction, half of your reduction into your eggs. Pop my... Egg yolks in, ta da! Yeah. In goes some of my tarragon wine reduction. There we go. Perfect. Give that a good whisk and then pop that onto the double boiler. Right. Now, the, the only thing with this sauce is that you have to whisk it continually. So you can't leave this and come back, otherwise you'll end up with scrambled eggs. So you have to make sure that you sit and as it starts to emulsify, you'll see slowly but surely it starts to cook. The actual egg mixture starts to thicken. Now, we cook this until we get what's known as ribbon stage. Now, ribbon stage means um, almost like it coats the back of the spoon, that if you if you let it fall back on itself, it forms like like ribbon peaks, for want of a better word. I mean, you can have a look at mine. Mine's nearly there. If you can see, it's quite cooking quite quickly. And it's all important that the eggs do cook out, otherwise it might split later. But see, this is the kind of thing where this kind of greasy sort of texture that I'm looking for. So say, important to whisk all the time. And that's what we should end up with. A nice, soft, gloopy, almost resembling a thick custard or whipped cream. You should have that sort of gloopy, so we call it ribbon stage when you draw when you draw your whisk through the mixture it should leave sort of ribbons behind. Yeah, that looks perfect. This is what I have so far. It's not quite as uh, not quite as thick as yours. But it looks I mean, like it's carrying a little bit longer. You haven't got any butter in there, have you? No, no butter. No, you just got your eggs and your and your and your reduction. Okay, I think cook that for a little bit longer. All right. Down we go. How much liquid did you pour in, just a matter of interest? Absolutely no idea. Okay. I looked at yours and guessed at about the same amount. Okay, that's cool. Head of interest, how much time do you spend when you're at home, given that being a chef is your full-time job, playing around with, experimenting, making impressive and dazzling meals, and how often do you sit back and say, you know, I actually just really feel like a tasted sandwich tonight? I, I mean, I do a lot of cooking at home. I don't know that I do much experimentation at home, um, uh, having to cook for a very, uh, a very um, select and a, a select crowd who are, who is my sternest critic. So I, I know, I know what goes down well here, and I stick to stick to what's what the family likes. Um, no, no, I just I find I love cooking. I love spending time in the kitchen at home. It's very, very different from work. Has, has it reinvigorated gonna, a little your love of cooking? Completely, you know. And and we've been we've been shooting a series of videos, uh, the lockdown recipes for disaster, um, which I'm really, really enjoying. You know, we, we again with all the videos you see of chefs doing all their kind of fabulous things. I've kind of put out a call to answer, say, let me know what you want to see. What is it that you're struggling with? You know, as chefs, we always take this red, as you said, that everyone knows how to do everything. And sometimes the simplest task is like cutting a chicken into eight, a whole chicken into eight pieces is something that most people don't know how to do. So, so I've started doing recipes like that. We've done a, a fresh pasta recipe and a, and a simple tomato sauce, a mushroom risotto, a very uh, a simple lamb curry, that kind of stuff. So again, things people can look at and go, oh, that's quite interesting. I'll give that a whirl. 
and 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 we've taken advice from what people wanted to see. We've people have written in with the suggestions about how to do. We've got a, a bread one coming up at the moment, a little focaccia that we've done. Um, and so trying to keep, again keep it simple, keep it to under 10, 10 minutes, that people can see in real time. You do a dish from beginning to end. I, yes. I like the suggestion of the roast chicken. I uh, attempted to carve one over the weekend, and it, it basically looked like Freddy Krueger had taken it apart. <laughs> yeah. Portioned by Edward Scissorhand. But I'm going to just start pouring my butter in because I don't want the butter to get cold. And I'm slowly right. whisking it into my egg mixture in the same way that you would do a mayonnaise. A little bit at a time, and then wait till each bit is completely absorbed into the into the into the sauce don't be tempted to pour it all in because it will split you're trying to just if you think of a mayonnaise where you put your your egg and your mustard base and you're slowly pouring in your oil we're doing the same with our with our bernays what i'm going to add to this is i'm just going to take a spoon i'm going to add two or three tablespoons of the hot water just to help bind it There we go. Right, let's have a look. How's your drink? Uh, not quite as solid as yours, but I'm not unhappy. Um, That's okay. I've always felt a slightly, a slightly lighter Bernays was the way to go. It, as long as the eggs cook, that's that's all that's important. And when they cook, they Perfect. will thicken the sauce, even if it's not if it's gloopy like mine. It's a little bit more of a pouring consistency. That's all also fine. It's the flavour that you're after. All right, so I'm uh, I'm leaving that on the hot water. Is that right? To just uh, cook yeah, through a little more. Yeah, but turn the water off though. Leave it on the pot, but turn the turn the turn the flame off so that it stops cool. cooking. And now you whisk done. slowly but surely. You whisk in your your melted butter. Cool. It's done. Okay, so now we want to season this. Now, be careful. Have a taste of it before you put salt and pepper in, because it all depends on if you use salted or unsalted butter. So I've used unsalted, so it's going to need quite a bit of salt, but always check first because if you've used salted butter it often doesn't need any seasoning at all mm. I have used salted butter but I think it could still do with the lightest smattering of salt cool. mm. and you can't fact, go wrong with lots of black pepper mm. I think I've got the teacher's pet roll nailed because I have here beautiful piece of ribeye that as per your instruction has been sitting for about 20 cool. minutes or so. Ooh, lovely Pete uh, so mine's been sitting in a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of Worcester sauce and some salt and pepper. Yes, and, and this is more of a, a seasoning than a marinade. I think one of the problems always with marinades is is that they tend to be sugar-based and, and what ends up happening is your expensive piece of beet tastes like burnt marinade. So now the second and, and, and very important is the seasoning. Good lashings of salt and pepper. <laughs> All right, steak is looking at me and saying, please cook and eat me. I think I'm ready to go. Well, I'm going to use a little tabletop gas fry here. Again, I'm cooking outside. So I've got my little weaver on the go here. So um, I'm just waiting a couple more seconds for that to heat up. I want it to be nice and hot before I throw my steak on. Uh, while we wait for that to warm up, Pete, tell me a little bit about the work you're doing with your soup kitchen in Cape Town and how you've managed to take advantage of a beer space to feed people. Okay, so... What we're doing, I'm doing with a friend of mine, um, Vainant Duplessis. We've got a, he's got a, a massive catering company, uh, Extreme Cuisine, and obviously all of our all of our business has ceased. It's all been cancelled. So all these restaurant kitchens and everything are standing dormant at the moment. We came up with an idea of going to Epping Market and buying literally a ton of veg a day, um, and then roping in chefs. Everyone's got the wherewithal to, to come give us a hand. So we operate six days a week. On each day, we have usually between eight and ten chefs. We each, each group only does one day a week so that we're not having too much contamination. We're obviously trying to keep it as safe as possible. You know, we have a health officer on board. We've got gloves and masks and, we you know, everyone has to sign in and have their temperature tested and all that kind of stuff. So we keep it as safe as possible. And then we literally spend all day peeling potatoes and onions and carrots and making these massive cauldrons of soup. Um, we puree that up and then we freeze it, and we cool it down and we freeze it into one kilo blocks, which we then vacuum pack. And then we distribute those to the NGOs. What they do is they then reheat that soup, they add another half liter of water and they get 
Every block gives them uh, a liter and a half of soup, six portions of soup. We don't make any profit on the soup. Um, so we rely purely on donations and obviously all our volunteer, all the chefs volunteer. It's an extraordinary initiative and one you can be very proud of being part of and kicking off, Pete. If people want to help, is there a way they can contribute? Um, they can. We've got um, a, a Superthon um, little snap scan uh, logo, which I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll put up on screen, um, and they can take the details from there. And we've got a separate account that FNB have set up for us, um, and all it's all completely um, what do you call it? Uh, transparent. We have a, an auditor looking after it, so they can audit everything for us, and people can literally go online and 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 pay whatever they can afford. I wish that you didn't have to be doing this, Pete, but given the need is there, I'm very glad that you are. And it's uh, wonderful that you're able to put your skills to good use, which is what you're doing now as well. How's that heat looking? Okay, now I'm looking nice and hot. I think we're ready to, to, to get our steak on the go. Oh. I mean, I'm looking at the size of your steak, same as mine, maybe three minutes on each side. We want it sort of nice and medium rare. Um, well, obviously, if you want to cook it for longer, if you know, if you if you feel the need to kill it twice, by all means, you know, you've spent a lot of money on your steak. Set it alight for all I care. It really is your steak to do what you like with. You're missing a beautiful trick if you do that, but I, you know, there's no accounting for taste. So I'm going to turn it 90 degrees, just so we get those sexy professional grill marks on our steak. Ah, these are the little tricks we learn from the masters. Mm. As we say, all important to let that rest for a couple of minutes. That's probably the biggest challenge because I just want to eat this right now. No, I know, you so want to just good. tuck into it. I know, it just I can smell it. I, I need to have it now kind of thing. Chef, just before I finish resting it, I just want to give you a... That's good. Look, there is my effort. Does Ooh, it get yummo. Me? Pick it up. I mean, yeah, same. Lovely jubbly. Oh. <laughs> All right, so now we're just going to finish that off and just spoon some of that. Oh, look at that glorious Bernays. Mm. Oh. Now that, as far as I'm concerned, is as good as it gets. Bernays, I think, is the perfect sauce for grilled meat. It works nicely with chicken and fish as well. I have to say I'm rather excited, Pete. Oh, look at that. Oh. I don't know if you can see that, but that is cooked. Huh. Look, oh, it's there it is. That, that's perfect, Dan. Perfect. Oh. Right. And of course, now so here the we test. Go. My, my first mouthful. Ha-ha. Mm. 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 This is what I said earlier, Pete. It's the mastery of you teaching people. It's not a complicated recipe. It's a fairly simple set of ingredients, but the result's just devastatingly good. Well, I think that's the secret to all good cooking. Most chefs will tell you. Simple food is the best. You've just got to get the technique right. You've got to get good ingredients and you've got to get the te technique right because then there's nowhere to hide. You can't wrap this in bacon and cover it with cheese sauce and then seven different kinds of cheese and gratinate it. Simple flavours, cooked simply, and, and you're always on to when I let the ingredients speak for themselves. So there we go, the perfect steak Bernays with Pete Goffwood. Also some really important information about the soup kitchens he is working with, and an absolute pleasure to have Pete join me. I'm going to head off, enjoy the rest of my steak, and get caught up in another good book. You saw Kitchen Cowboys at the start. Here's another one you might want to try, A Life Digested. It's a great memoir. It's a great cooking book. It's a fabulous read. That'll keep me going until next week when we're back with Kitchen Clothes with Bright Rock and another fantastic South African chef and another fantastic South African recipe. Cheers.